All right. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at this, the reception of, of members by transfer or profession of faith. So this will be the right that we have in the uh, service itself. It usually will occur right after um, or right before the prayers of the church. I can't remember exactly. Um, yeah, prior to the prayers of the church. Uh, and so at that point in the service, that'll be when I, and this will be, this is slated to be like the second Sunday of November, something like that. Um, I'll get you the date by the end of class. So the way this will work is I'll invite you guys to come up and you'll all line up in that space in the front and you'll be facing me and I will ask you these questions. Um, and so one of my things that I like to do in new member classes is go through those so everybody knows what you're agreeing to um, when you're going to do that. Okay. So, um, so I'll just go through how it's going to start. I'll start with a um, a little reading from scripture from Mark cha or M Matthew chapter 10. Whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my father who is in heaven. Lift up your hearts, therefore, to God, to the God of all grace and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. So do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? And don't worry, you won't have, there aren't really long answers here. The only, um, the, I think the longest answer you have to give is I do by the grace of God. And I will prompt those answers from you, okay? Um, so in this first question, we're talking about the gifts that God has given you in baptism, okay? Uh, which, do you know offhand what we in our confession say are the gifts we received in our baptism? Take a guess. Life, the spirit, huh? Were we given the blessing of eternal life? Okay, so new life, right? Yeah. And which is eternal life in Christ. What else? Spirit. The spirit. Okay. Okay. What about sin? Sin. That's what I was thinking. We got the gift of sin. No, we were free of sin. We the, the cleansing of sin. The cleansing right? of sin. Yeah, very good. <laughs> The one more related to the spirit starts with an F. Hey. Faith, right? Now, um, and we'll obviously we'll get into more details on these, but in our confession of faith, faith is a gift, right? It's not an intellectual action that we take. It's not that we read something <laughs> and I don't know. No. I agree with that, therefore I believe. Okay? Faith is, nothing um, like faith is something given to you from God via the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about um, baptism is what one of the things that we call the means of grace, um, where one of the arguments we'll hear a lot about is, um, well, yeah, but the Holy Spirit does what he's going to do. You can't control him. So how can you say that this person receives the Spirit? And our response to that would be, well, we don't say that. Jesus said that. Right? And so baptism is one of the means by which the Holy Spirit has promised to be given. And the primary means by which the Holy Spirit is promised to be given is what? So baptism is a specific form of this, but the general gift of the Holy Spirit is given through God's word. Right? So there's God's word spoken in baptism. Right? So I, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Right? Some um, people say Holy Ghost. Right. And in Matthew 28, that's part of what Jesus commands the disciples to do in the Great Commission. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, so that's the first one. So that's what you're going to be. So we'll, we'll go through in more detail about baptism when we get to that in the doctrine sessions. But that is what you're going to be agreeing to. Right? That in baptism, that's actually what's happening. Right? Um, so one of the big distinctions in baptism is infant baptism versus non-infant baptism. The reason we practice infant baptism in the Lutheran Church is because we believe faith is a gift. And so it's not based on whether or not you can grasp it intellectually. So the practice of not doing infant baptism came about because of the argument for the age of reason. That, well, like an infant can't 
think for themselves. So how can they make uh, a pledge of faithfulness? Well, we don't think that baptism is a pledge of our faithfulness to God. It's a pledge of God's faithfulness to us, which is far more important because we're not very faithful. Right? So if our baptismal identity was reliant on our faithfulness, it would not be great. Does anyone right? really remember their baptism? Most of us very young, very babies. Well, so when we talk about remembering <coughs> our baptism, we're not necessarily talking about cognitively no, remembering because if you were baptized when you were like me like three weeks old yeah i don't remember much of anything I when i was three weeks old right? um so uh like that's one of the reasons i make the sign of the cross in church is it it's a sign of remembrance of my baptism in the name of the father son and the Holy spirit right um and so what you're remembering <laughs> is that you have been baptized and because of that you have this new life in christ all right. The next question is, do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? So this is, again, you're, you would be then asserting that you believe the devil is real and that you believe that what he wishes to do and what he wishes you to do are not good. So you're renouncing all of those things. Um, do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit? Okay. So believe it or not, there have been numerous Christians throughout history, and even some today, that do not believe in the Trinity. So we confess a Trinitarian uh, Christian denomination, which we can, so that means we confess that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God. So they're the three in one. Most of, and we'll get into this a little bit when we go with the creeds, most of the church controversies in the, like throughout the history of the church were all about the person of Jesus and whether or not he was just a human who became a God eventually, whether he was a God from the get-go and just pretending to be a human, or whether he was true God and true man. So a lot of those big controversies um, were about the person of Jesus. So what you're saying here, when you make this um, confession, you're saying, yes, I believe in God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So you're confessing faith in the triune God. Any questions about that? Okay. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic <coughs> scriptures to be the inspired word of God and the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church drawn from them and confessed in the small catechism to be faithful and true. Okay, so this one gets into some of the more common disagreements among like Christian denominations. So what is the phrase inspired word of God? God was inspired. God was inspired? Well, he was inspiring us. Okay, who specifically? Everybody. Or we're talking about the word of God. If you're a Christian. Well, but that came from somewhere. <laughs> you didn't. Okay, there we go. The Bible. So when we're talking about the word of God here, these are the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God. What I so, personally believe is that men wrote the Bible, but they, they got it from somewhere. Okay. So that's what that phrase so it doesn't mean that we believe that God, like the hand of God, literally wrote the Bible, but that he inspired those who did to write the truth. Okay. So inspired comes from uh, the Latin inspiratus, which is mean to be like in the spirit. So you can even hear the word spirit and in inspire. Okay? So it's spirit inspired. Um, so thus, we don't have an issue with moses writing the first five books of the bible that doesn't then give us the idea that well what if moses was wrong well we would say that moses was inspired by god so what he wrote was what god wanted him to write okay? and some people find that hard to believe which is strange to me because if god can create the universe and everything and it's simply by speaking it seems like inspiring humans to write the words he wants them to write is not a very difficult task for him to do um, and that's what we believe the Bible is, um, that it is the inspired word of God. So that, that means that 
even if it butts up against my reason. So like the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. Um, I confess faith in the Trinity because God's word says that this is the way it is. And even though I don't really understand how you can be three distinct persons yet only one. And I can't explain that to you rationally or logically. Okay? Sometimes there's no logical explanation. Right. But if you're somebody who doesn't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, but a collection of stories about historical accounts written by men in order to pass down this moral tradition, which a lot of people do, then you don't view it as something that can be over and above your reason. So you're always like, so the difficult stuff you try to explain away. So this is how you have Christian denominations who will say that it's okay to be homosexual or that abortion is not wrong because they don't believe the scriptures are the inspired word of God. And so they use argument, rational arguments, historical context arguments to say like, oh, well, when Paul said that, that was because this was the, the nature of the day. And that's that. no longer the same. I don't know. Right? Um, well, I mean, some of those arguments would make sense if the Bible wasn't the inspired word of God, right? And so Christians have never been concerned with the changes of the earthly cultures, right? Christianity wouldn't have lasted as long as it has if we were trying to conform to the cultures we were. We're not trying to do that. In fact, we're trying to transform those cultures through living as God intends us to live. So they too come to the same faith. Um, so that's one. So that's the place of scripture. So uh, scripture is for us the norm and practice of the Christian life. That's the best way to be. The norm, and the, norm oh, the normal, the norm, the norm and practice of the Christian life. Sorry. I so if you want to know, huh? Oh, <laughs> no. So if uh, if you ever have a question about how you you ought to live, what you should, how you should view particular things. We always go back to the scriptures. And we're very serious about that in our denomination. I had to pass tests in Greek and Hebrew so that I could read and translate the Bible um, in order to become a pastor in our church. You didn't have to learn Latin? No. Catholics well, Catholics have to learn Latin because they did the Mass in Latin, but the original yes. languages of the scriptures, the Old Testament is biblical Hebrew and the New Testament is Greek. And so those are the original languages that they would have been written. And so that's why we learned those. Um, yeah. Um, so like, for example, um, like what's your favorite translation of the Bible? What do you like to use or what I like to read? Oh, English. <laughs> well, there's a lot of English translations. So the one we use here at church is the ESV, the English Standard Version. And something you may notice with the English Standard Version is at times, it sounds weird when you're reading it or saying it out loud. Some, to the point where sometimes you'll read it as it's written and you'll think you've messed it up. And that's because the ESV as a translation tries to as, you know, as closely as possible stick to the original text, which means that sometimes it doesn't sound great in English because there's different well, English forms. English is and, one of the so. hardest languages for other people. Well, sure, but this is related to like there's two camps in when you translate works from one language to another. One is um, sort of like the King James version, which is more artistic and tries to read into the the other language the way this would be expressed in English, right? So, for example, um, in German, you would say "guten Tag," which is "good day." No one says "good day." in English. No, the equivalent of good day in English is, hi, how are you? But for a German speaker, when you ask them, a total stranger says, hi, how are you? They're confused because that's not a question that you normally ask a total stranger. But it is here because people aren't really asking, how are you doing? It's just a form of reading, right? And so if you are translating a book in German and it says, guten Tag, the ESV would say good day in English, even though it's not a phrase that English speakers normally use. Whereas another translation might say, well, the English equivalent of that phrase would be, hi, how are you? Does that make sense? 
but so, you know what? When I'm at work, I'm a cashier. I'm just uh, stepping in tomorrow for a few hours just to help them out. But every time I'm done with the customer, I'll say, have a good day. Sure. I don't want to sit down and say, have a great day. But I prefer that. Because sure. Not, it's not pushing. Well, and so I, when I lived in Germany for a year, I when I came back, I, I stopped saying, how are you as much unless I actually wanted to know the answer. Because it did strike me as strange after living there for a year that we would ask that question as a form of greeting. And I actually had one of the students when he was in the United States at our seminary actually pulled me aside one day and he says, and he asked me, there are a bunch of people that ask me, how am I doing every day? Do they actually want to know or am I just supposed to say good? And I told him most of the time, you just say good. Um, so, so that's an example of sort of those two different camps. So on one, right. the I'm ESB sorry. is one extreme. That's very, very common in our society. How are you? Yeah. So the ESV is one extreme where it's very emphasizing of the original language, which is why we favor it because we're very concerned with that. On the other extreme would be like a translation of the message. If you've ever read any of the message, the message isn't even really a translation. Um, because it goes so far into trying to, to read into the cultural meaning that it uses different words entirely. So like uh, the best example is uh, in the Lord's Prayer where it says, give us this day our daily bread. The message says, give us three square meals today, right? Which, you know, I would say pastorally speaking and theologically, the message is not a great translation. It has very limited uses, but like, give us this day our daily bread is a much broader category than food. And so you're actually losing some of the meaning there. But those are the two main. So what you're going to be asserting is that you believe that it's the inspired word of God. And so we have much more care in making sure that we're accurately representing that, which is why I don't preach about my own thoughts and things like that. I preach from a biblical text. And by the way, I so, love broccoli. <laughs> uh, I actually like it too. Um, but that was just an example. Okay. Um, so that's one thing. So you have the scripture here. So we're saying what we believe about the scriptures. And then the second part of the question is and the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church drawn from them and confessed in the small catechism. So we would say the small catechism is one of the confessional writings of Lutheran church because we believe that it's a faithful exposition of the scriptures. So it has, the small catechism has no authority in and of itself. It's only authority comes from that it's, we believe it's faithfully drawn from the scriptures. So it's a borrowed authority. Right? Um, and there's some confusion about that. There's sometimes that people will feel like uh, one of the criticisms of our denomination at times can be that we hold our confessional writings to the same level as the Bible. Well, in a certain sense, that's true, and in a certain sense, it's not. It's true in the sense that the reason that we hold them up as authoritative is because their authority is derived from the scriptures. So what you're saying when you're becoming Lutheran is, in a sense, the confessional writings of the Lutheran church are faithful expositions of scripture, therefore, I believe. Right? Um, it can be used incorrectly when you talk about them and use them as if they have their own authority. You don't make that scriptural connection then people rightly so feel strange about that. like well why did this thing that this guy wrote who because luther says some things that we don't agree with he's just a guy right so he's just a sinner like everybody else so he says he has things in his writings and things that he said that we're like eh, no that's not what the bible says but, um so so that's what that question is about so the first that the scriptures the inspired word of god and the the confessional writings of our church are faithfully drawn from it. Okay, make sense? All right. Now, the next question, do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? So this is a question about what? Communion. Communion? To <laughs> Going to church, right? So the question that I'll ask you, and this is sort of kind of a, like you've probably heard of the people who say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I've heard that okay? Right. That's a very common group of people in the United States because we think that any sort of form and structure is in, inhibits our freedom. 
which is dumb. Um, but so what we're saying here is that we're actually supposed to gather together to hear God's word and to receive the body and blood of Jesus, which we'll get to in a moment. And so what you're doing is you're expressing that your intent is to do that regularly. Okay. Um, and the best way I can explain this is um, viewing worship service not as something you must do in order to be a quote unquote good Christian, but as something that you need as a sinner in need of salvation. Right. So um, it's more like a rock in a storm than it is a check on a checklist. Um, and then um, the question that I would ask somebody who identifies themselves as spiritual but not necessarily religious is, do you believe anything unique happens here on Sunday that doesn't happen elsewhere? Like yes. there are people that will say, well, I can go out in nature and experience God in more profound ways than sitting in a pew and listening to the same set of words over. And that argument holds a lot of sway over a lot of people. But we disagree with that. <laughs> we um, need you. Hmm? You don't need me. <laughs> I, I serve in an office, and it's that office that you need. Yes. You because need that. that office is part of the institution of the church, which Christ instituted for the purpose of maintaining and supporting the faith of the body of Christ. So the worship service is not for people that aren't here. It's for the members of the congregation. So um, there's a lot of confusion about this because one of the things that churches have done in the last half century is they've adapted and changed their worship services to appeal to people who are not yet members of their congregation. And they've turned something that was meant to be for the shepherding and care of the sheep into an evangelistic tool, which it's not designed to be. So can somebody come in and hear the word of God and, and the songs and be have faith created in them and want to become a member of this church? Sure. Yes. Right. And we pray that that happens. But the worship service is not meant primarily to do that. That's sort of a secondary blessing of that. Right. Um, and we'll get it more into the way God intends the church, not the building, but the people to spread his word. And it's not through using our worship service plan, okay? Um, so we would say that something unique does happen here, which is why this question is part of your, your public confession of faith. Um, and that is that you're coming together as a body of Christ. So in Hebrews, it talks about that, that we should not give up the habit of gathering together as some have done, right? Which is something that has been sort of fresh on the minds of many Christians in the last year and a half. Right? Because to what degree do we obey the, the authorities of the law of the land? Because they, they get their authority from God. Uh, and and at, wit, at what point is that, are they, have they stepped out of their God-given authority and just started using their own and we're not to follow them? Um, so like a good example is, uh, was it MacArthur? Pastor MacArthur in Southern California, pastor of a big non-denominational church. They went along with the lockdowns for like six to seven months. And then when they said they were going to essentially be extended indefinitely, they said, okay, we're going to worship. Because he decided, their church decided that they're calling from God to gather together as the people of God and be sustained in their faith through the gifts of the church was greater need than fears about getting COVID. So, um, and there's a bit of that. I'm, I'm trying to think it was, two or three weeks ago when I talked about the uh, Quo Vadis story, um, where, whither goest thou, where are you marching to, when Peter is leaving Rome because Nero is killing all the Christians and he sees Jesus going the other direction, carrying his cross. He says, where are you going? He says, to be crucified again. And then Peter realizes that his preservation of his earthly self is of less importance than the works of mercy and the spreading of the gospel in the midst of that too. And so he turns and goes back. Right? And so th this is, is sort of that question of the place of the divine service on Sunday should be one of extreme importance for you because it's the primary means by which God is supporting you 
in your faith. That's where the term divine service comes from. It's the divine serving you. Okay? Which is very odd. Usually in forms of religious worship, it's us serving whatever God we're worshiping. But in our case, it's actually the opposite. So he thinks you're so funny. <laughs> uh, probably all the, all the hand gestures. Um, so one of the, uh, just as kind of a aside, when people will make the claim to you that, well, there's lots of religions out there and, and all these different paths and they all lead to the same place. Uh, and most religions are basically alike. You can say, I don't believe that because Christianity actually moves in the opposite direction as every other religion. Every other religion is about you becoming worthy and ascending to a level of being acknowledged by the God that you worship. And Christianity is about a God who recognizes that we can't do that. We can't make any progress in the ascent. And so he descends to do what we could not, to serve us despite our unworthiness. And so the worship service is the playing out of that, is the participation in that relationship. I didn't know that. That God is coming and serving you. Yep. So th that's why the two high points of the worship service are the service of the word, when the scriptures are read, and the service of the sacrament, where the body and blood of Jesus is given. Because the high points are when God is serving you. And that's why when the word is read, we say, thanks be to God. In recognition of that truth. So when you answer this question, you're essentially saying you believe that's what worship is. And that it's important that you attend regularly. Not, not so that you can check it off your do-gooder list, but so that you can, so that your faith can be nourished and you can survive. Okay. And shouldn't we want to come too? Yes, yeah, it's not really but it's yeah. also, I mean, you want to come to church for the same reason you want to eat dinner. It's so that you don't die. Yes. Right? So dinner is a representation of your need for food. So if you skip a dinner now and again, no big deal. But if you never eat food, you'll die because you need it. So this is your spiritual food and you need it. And that's what we're talking about here. Right? So that's why this question focuses on hearing the word of God, gift one, and receiving the Lord's Supper, gift two. Okay. And you'll start to notice, too, if you think of worship that way, that the placing of the songs are intentional. So notice that we sing songs of praise after receiving these gifts and not prior. So we do confession at the beginning, and then after confession, we sing praise um, for receiving the gift and so on. Any questions about that? Okay. Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? So this then, so the first, that previous question is dealing with justification. God's saving work for you as his, now as his child. Right? The second question is, to dealing with what we call sanctification, which is the leading of a holy life. So now that you have been saved and you have faith in the gospel and in Jesus, how then you ought to live is really what this is going on. So, so um, because you believe that the word of God is the inspired word, then that becomes the measurement and the guide for your life as a follower of Christ. Right? And so do you intend to live according to the word of God is basically as a believer, are you now going to strive to live as, as you're called to in the scriptures because you believe that is the inspired word of God. So therefore it's the highest level of authority in your life, right? So that means that even if your entire neighborhood or your entire city or your entire country <coughs> is asking you to do something contrary to God's word, <coughs> you say, and here it gives you the most extreme resistance to wanting to live that way, which is death. So even if you risk your life in doing so, will you adhere and remain true to God? And what you're saying is, I do by the grace of God. And so we can't do that on our own, but we can with, with his aid. Right? And this is one area where I think you know, learning about global 
Christianity is helpful because it can, this question can seem archaic because when was the last time you thought or knew of anybody who died because they believed in Jesus? Well, that still happens every day in lots of places in the world. And it may happen again in my lifetime or your life. Or you may just happen to find yourself in a situation where this is the choice presented to you. And it may not be somebody of another relig aggressive religion pointing a gun at your face and saying, renounce Jesus. It may be that you're called to stand for and confess Christ in your workplace or amongst your family to great risk for yourself. Maybe it's a relational risk. Maybe you're going to lose your job. Um, so one that comes to mind is... Um, I'm sure you've heard some of the news about Loudoun County, Virginia, and the school board there and, and the really aggressive stuff they've been doing on the progressive end of things. Well, they invited their teachers to share their thoughts at a meeting and said, you can share them free of any repercussions. And so the PE teacher, as a Christian, said that he would not use these preferred pronouns and encourage his students to do something that he believes is a violation of his faith. And it disrespects God who made him. And he was fired. And then he got reinstated because they had no grounds for firing. But he took a great personal risk to adhere to his faith. And that's essentially what this question is asking. Is do you intend to do that? Um, now, if you mess up in a situation and you don't do that, or because you're afraid you don't, is that the end of the road for you? Of course, right? Then you come, you intend to hear the word of God, receive the Lord's praise, and then you come to worship and you confess that sin and you hear the forgiveness of Christ. And then you go out there and you begin that fight anew. Okay? Any questions about that one? All right? Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? So that one's more specific to the confession that you're now making. And the, the church there is capital C Church. So that's not Ascension Lutheran, right? Um, so that doesn't mean like if the building's on fire, you're going to risk your life by running in here to grab the communion ware or something stupid like that. Don't do that. That's just stuff. <clears throat> the capital C Church refers to the invisible church, which is people who have genuine faith in Jesus. Right? Now, our belief is that those people exist in our church body but they also exist in other denominations so we are in a denomination that says well if you aren't lutheran you're just you're out of luck right um but the invisible church is is invisible you can't you can't know right um i can't know what's in people's hearts so like communion our communion approach is a good example like to the best of our ability my responsibility is to be forthright with you about what communion is so that you don't take it to your own detriment. But are you certainly able to walk the walk and talk the talk, but in your heart not believe? Yeah. But that's no longer my responsibility. That's now on you. Um, so my job is to do what I'm called to do. Um, and so that's, that's what this question is getting at. <clears throat> Any questions about that one? No, I just have to say, I don't care what anyone else's religion is. I, as, as long as they believe in something, that's fine with me. And I, I always live by the credo of um, the Bible, do unto others as you would have them do unto God. I mean, my credo is- So I'm gonna push back against that because that's actually not what we're confessing. We're confessing that you ought to care what others believe. Oh, yes. And so Absolutely. we don't say, I don't care what you believe because not, and I'm not saying that because you go around picking fights with people, but when you say do unto others as you would have them do unto you, it does not translate as leave them alone. Mm -hmm. It translates as share Christ with them. Oh. Right. Because that's what we want them. That's what we would want them to do to us. I'm sorry. Right? My, no, 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 that's fine. What I said was, I believe that even if someone is being a jerk, I will treat them the same way that I would like to be treated. Yes, and that is what that's calling to you. But I think oftentimes, like the way you said that, and I don't necessarily know if this is what you believe, but people say that without really understanding what those words mean, that like we actually are people who deeply care about what other people believe because, not because 
we want to fight them about it because we want them to know Jesus. And so we don't go around doing the American thing of, you know, you do you, bro, live your best life, you know, um, whatever floats your boat, as long as you don't float your boat into my pond, we're cool, we're kosher, whatever you want to say, we disagree with that. Right? That doesn't mean you go out there and beat people over the head with a Bible, okay? But what it does mean is when the opportunity presents itself, you don't shy away from sharing the word of God that you believe, because you also want them to believe. So if they believe in the great big flying spaghetti monster, you care about that because you don't want them to believe in something that isn't Jesus. Because like this, the gospel reading today, the ending for people who don't believe in Jesus is not good. And we don't want that for them, right? Um, and so now that we're sort of like, um, maybe the, an easy way to think about it is like, we've now become in the know. And now what you know is that there's a terrible disease that only has one cure. Before you didn't even know there was a disease, but now you know there's a disease and the only cure is Jesus. And so we can no longer walk around pretending that there's a hundred different cures or that there's no problem to me. And so now our life has changed as a result of that knowledge, okay? Um, so that's when you confess faith that we, that we share, that's what we believe. We believe that it isn't our prerogative to go out there and be jerks about it, right? You speak the truth in love with gentleness and respect but you speak the truth and for us the truth is that christ is the only way to salvation and so we want as many people to have the opportunity to believe in him by virtue of the holy spirit right? so we'll flesh that out a little bit more when we get to when we get to some of that stuff um, but that's the basis uh then the question this one's pretty straightforward do you desire to become a member of this congregation and then then there is one last question after that, which is, will you support the work our gracious Lord has given this congregation with your prayers and the gifts that God has given you? Okay, so uh, in other words, will you be a like contributing member? Now, when I say contributing, I don't mean like giving money. your money, okay? Um, that's part of the gifts that God has given you. So I'll be honest about that. I mean, Jesus talks a lot about money, why does Jesus care about money? Because it's a spiritual heart issue, not because he needs your money. God doesn't need your money. Um, he's been around a lot longer than the dollar, right? Um, but he knows that that's a spiritual danger for each one of us, because if we, if we accrue too much of it and forget that it isn't ours, that we're stewards, and that it comes from God, then we start to put our hope and trust in that rather than in him. Um, but the gifts of God uh, that he's given you is a broader, more holistic understanding, right? It means the gift of your time. Time is a very valuable gift. Or the gift of talents and skills that he's given you. Right? So if you're good with computers or if you like numbers or if you're a good communicator, all these different things can be gifts that you use in service to the church. Um, and then obviously prayers for self expansion offering up prayers for the congregation. Um, so any questions about that one? Yeah. So after that, here's what I will say. Upon this, your confession of faith. So what those questions essentially did is your public spoken confession of faith. I acknowledge publicly that you are members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and of this congregation. Receive the Lord's Supper and participate with us in all the blessings of salvation that our Lord has given to his church in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we do uh, prayer. So that's what you are confessing as you join this church. Now, I know some of you guys are transfers from other Lutheran churches, um, but a couple of people in here are not. Um, and so, and even if you are, you maybe didn't go through this um, question by question before. Um, but I like to say that I want you to know what you're getting into going both eyes open. Um, so those will be, that'll be the question, the series of questions that I ask you on New Member Sunday. And in order to really flush out what you're agreeing to there, that's what we're going to be focusing on in the next six weeks with our emphasis on the different doctrines of the church. Um, so we're going to be looking at the six chief parts is what they're called in the catechism. And they are baptism, Lord's Supper, um, the confession of sins and the office of the keys. Office of the keys is a phrase referring to 
the authority of the pastoral office that we confess, not the individual inhabiting the office, but the office itself. Um, the Lord's Prayer, Ten Commandments, and the Apostles' Creed. So those will give us the overview of the basic confession of the Christian faith that we have here in the LCMS that will allow you to answer those questions informed and in good faith. Okay. Any questions about any of that? What? Okay, so then just kind of for our last five minutes, I thought, we could have some fun because I know everybody has some sort of question about, it could be about any of the stuff we covered or just in general that they've wanted to ask and never had the opportunity or maybe they were afraid to ask the church. And this is the place to ask, so okay. yeah. <laughs> the sign of the cross. Okay. Never did that when I was in a Lutheran church and now I see people doing it here. Yeah. So, so I should have been doing this all the, all the while? Uh, no, not necessarily. It's a good question. The question is, um, you know, you grew up not doing the sign of the cross, and here we do the sign of the cross. Um, so I would put this under the category of what's called like personal piety. Mm -hmm. So the reason that I do it and, and the reason that many people do it is it's a remembrance of your baptism. So you're rem remembering that you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, which is also why it's the invocation for our service as we're starting remembering that like, we, are we are enabled to have this relationship which we're about to engage in in worship because we've been called by Christ in our baptism. And we've been made his children as opposed to people dead in sin, right? And so anytime the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is spoken, you can make the sign of the cross as a remembrance of that. And but it's just something that it, if it helps- Because I was born and raised Catholic, so I always well, do it. <laughs> okay, so- because my friends were all Catholic, so before the sun, we it seemed like they went this way. Oh yeah, I I apparently do it the opposite way that Catholics do. I mean, so along I do. So is this the Catholic this way? Oh yeah, I instead do. Instead of left, right. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the Catholic way. The yeah. short answer is that <laughs> stuff doesn't matter. So <laughs> in our understanding, that would be if if you want to bow, like some some pastors and some people. When you say the name of the Trinity, they will bow out of reverence for the name of God. Um, you can do that. Um, so you'll see also that uh, sometimes after communion, people make the sign of the cross mm -hmm. after communion. It's really up to you. There's no like right or wrong there. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a commanded thing. Um, those are a little bit more um, legalistically applied in the Catholic church. It has a steeper tradition for one and two. I think there's extra weight applied to those sorts of outward actions that we don't really apply. So you'll go to some churches and they don't do that at all. Um, and others that do, and some pastors don't do that stuff, some do. Okay. So like you're not you're not missing out or losing anything by not having done. Yeah, don't feel um, bad. <laughs> so it's meant to be sort of like when you make a mnemonic device to remember something important. It's similar to that. At least for me. Um, so, and it's the same with uh, like if you break down, you know, like why do I wear what I wear? Um, is it to set me apart and make me special? No, it's actually the opposite, right? I'm wearing all black because it's a representation of my sin. So, even though I'm a pastor, I'm a sinner like everyone else. And there's only one spot of what I'm bringing that's pure, which is God's word, which is spoken, which is why this is that. So, um, but those things, like if, if I'm up there in sandals, cargo shorts, and a Hawaiian shirt, can I, I'm not going to, but like, if we're in a situation where like, you know, I have some major disaster at home, yeah. and this gets covered in a bunch of terrible stuff or whatever, like, and the option is being a little bit more informal in my dress and still doing church or not doing church, like this isn't something we wouldn't do church, we would stop doing church for um, they're meant to be helpful uh, things, but they're not like this must be there, otherwise you're Anyone not doing who doesn't something. Know who you are, how to figure it out. Yeah, it's also very useful. It's the same <laughs> reason it's useful for a police officer on duty to wear a uniform, because then other people know why they're there and what they're about. You know what, Pastor, in the Catholic religion, they always wear the robes, but they, they wear the same clothes you do when they're not in conducting mass. Yeah. So 
so I, I'll wear this. Uh, well, I wear it with khakis during the week, but I wear the clerical, especially when I do hospital visitation or I'm doing something specific to the, the office of the pastor. But it's again, so the, the, the Greek word that we use to describe this is called adiaphora. So adiaphora refers to the whole slew of things that are neither commanded nor prohibited explicit, explicitly in the scriptures. Um, so like the manner of dress, which denotes respect to God and the worship service is not handed down in black and white in the scriptures. So there's no right or wrong way to dress in church. Now, you can enter into the realm of other sins if you push that to its extremes, but um, generally speaking, like making the sign of the cross falls in that same category. If it's helpful for you, do it. If it's not, or if you have something else that you like to do, go for it. Okay. Good question. Any others? Yeah, I got one. Uh, uh, there are some people that believe the, the Holy Day is on Saturday. Is in the Bible, you know. mm -hmm. yeah. So the original Sabbath was uh, Saturday, um, because the way that the uh, Israelites and the Jewish people measured a day was from sundown to sunup, and so. Um, but we we now worship on Sundays because uh, the resurrection was on Sunday, and so that's we shifted the Sabbath to Sunday. It's also because we no longer follow the Sabbath law as, been, as it was given in the Old Testament. Um, so essentially the reason for that is because we view the resurrection of Jesus as the first fruits of a new creation. So the reason that Saturday was considered Sabbath was because it was the final day of creation where God rested. And so we shifted it to Sunday because there's a new creation now in all right well think of those sorts of questions to ask any time during class even if they're not necessarily on topic i'll try and leave some time at the end of class for those sorts of questions because i don't want you to just get the basics but certain things people have encountered lots of different things in churches over the years even other lutheran churches that they're like why did we do this or why didn't we do this please ask those that's the purpose of this sort of class is so that if you've got anything you know bumping around in your brain that has given you misgivings about about church or just confusion about topics this class is the place to sort of deal with that so um and if i don't know the answer i'll tell you i don't know but i'll look it up and if there is one to give then i'll give it if there's not i'll say there's no, there's no reason you know there's no answer so all right. Well, it's a little after 12, so let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for these people who are coming to join your church here at Ascension Lutheran. They're entering into our membership, either as transfers from other churches um, with similar uh, confessions of faith, or they're newly confessing the Lutheran faith. And I just ask that as you guide them along this journey, that their knowledge about you and your word can grow and deepen. And most of all, their knowledge about the new relationship that they have with you in Jesus. Um, I pray that as we begin our sessions on our doctrine um, this next week and the following month, that you would bless our discussions, that they would be enlightening and uplifting as we discover more and more how wondrous and deep and great your mercy is for each and every one of us. In the name of Jesus, I pray all these things. Amen. All right.